The global headlines are darker than ever. The fears of a great war are at fever pitch. Internal conflicts appear to be rising again after a long-term decline. Terrorism has also increased and democracies are in retreat. Making matters worse, the doomsday clock is ticking ever closer to midnight. But is this doom and gloom really justified? Well, contrary to what the media seems to indicate, the facts are otherwise. Major wars between states have all but been extinguished. Civil wars are also, if you take the long view, on the decline. Murder, assault, domestic violence, capital punishment are all way down. And it's not just physical violence. Homophobia, racism, and sexism are also on the way out. None of this was by accident or spontaneous. But people are living longer, healthier, wealthier lives. Why? Well, welcome to Steven Pinker's world. And welcome also to the Phil Lind Initiative Series on the Unraveling of the Global Liberal Order hosted by the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs here at UBC. I'm Robert Mugga, your host and a visiting Lind Scholar. We are delighted to be joined here today <clears throat> by Steven Pinker, uh, a professor of psychology at Harvard and author of the best-selling book, Better Angels of Our Nature. Stephen is also on the cusp of releasing a new book, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. Stephen is best known for his popular thesis that violence is actually coming down. He attributes this to a series of big shifts, pacification, civilizing effects, humanitarian revolutions, the long and the short peace, and the rights revolution. And while we still suffer from predation, from dominance, from revenge, from sadism and ideology, these demons are increasingly overpowered by self-control, by empathy, by morality, and by reason. Stephen has received rave reviews, not least by Bill Gates, some criticism, and a legion of followers. And notwithstanding his epic work on violence, it's perhaps his work on vision, linguistics, and social relations that's earned him the most extraordinary distinctions, including from the National Academy of Sciences all the way to the Association of Psychological Sciences. Sciences. Stephen, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> first things first, what got you into all of these issues? What, what led you to stray from what I think are the relatively safe confines of psychology into the hurly-burly, the rough and tumble of the battlefield? Well, you'd be surprised at how high emotions can rise on, on debates on irregular verbs, which I've been embroiled in. <laughs> but how do you go from irregular verbs to genocide and, uh, and world war? Uh, it, it's, uh, the common denominator is, is human nature. What makes us tick? What kind of animals are we? And in arguing that there is such a thing as human nature, um, I got the uh, pushback that a belief in human nature is somehow reactionary or regressive. Because according to this criticism, if you believe that we have an evolved nature, then aren't you saying, well, we can never improve uh, human affairs. We're just uh, saddled with all of these, this evolutionary baggage, and so it's hopeless to try to make the world a better place. We're always going to be violent, we're always going to be jealous, and, and so on. <clears throat> My answer was, well, human nature is a complex system. We do have some ugly impulses. We do have impulses toward revenge and dominance and exploitation and, uh, and sadism. But that's not all there is in the brain. The brain's a pretty complicated place. We also have have empathy and self-control and uh, norms and uh, moral norms and, and uh, ability to solve problems. And over the course of history, we've developed institutions that bring out our better angels, as Abraham Lincoln called them, and bit by bit allow them to predominate over our uh, the uglier parts of human nature. But crucially, I mean, that's just a theory. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I added, you don't have to speculate about whether that's possible. It's happened. Uh, if you look over the course of, of uh, history, not only have certain barbaric institutions been abolished, such as human sacrifice, such as chattel slavery, but quantitative measures, when you actually look at the rates as opposed to just remembering headlines, show that murder rates have gone down, rates of death in warfare, uh, violence against women, violence against children, uh, and so on. So people are living longer, healthier, wealthier, more prosperous lives. Um, and I think your statistics suggest that conflicts have the, at least great war battles have come down, and even the, the, the internal conflicts have become less violent or virulent than the past, yet we still have this incredibly gloomy perspective right now, especially right now, perhaps. And you've suggested this might be because of the nature of the if it leads, it bleeds, kind of uh, sensationalist uh, biases within the media, perhaps it's about historical amnesia, but why this mismatch between what is manifestly a good news story and yet the gloom and doom that prevails today, in, in our, at least in the West? Part of it is a, 
an interaction between the nature, <coughs> excuse me, the nature of news and the nature of cognition. Namely, we assess uh, the world through uh, incidents, anecdotes, images. Uh, we didn't evolve to process statistics, but we sure do remember the explosions or the, the, uh, the kidnappings. And news um, not only capitalizes on that, if it, uh, as you said, if it, if it bleeds, it leads, but in a way, just the nature of news, namely stuff that happens as opposed to stuff that doesn't happen or stuff that happens very, very gradually, um, will, will naturally lean toward gory uh, images and, and anecdotes. You, you could ha have the headline, uh, 180,000 people escaped from extreme poverty yesterday, every day for the last 30 years. But on no day was, did that headline run, uh, even though that's a highly significant fact. And so our impressions do get miscalibrated mm. compared to reality. There's also a, um, a phenomenon that psychologists call the negativity bias, that bad is stronger than good. Mm. We dread losses more than we savor gains. We uh, are attentive to all the ways that things go wrong. That kind of opens up a market for people to remind us of things Where? that have gone wrong that we may have forgotten. Where, where does that come from? Is that a function, is that something genetic? Is that something that goes back to our ancestors where we generally had gloomy news, where one quarter of our species would die of all sorts of causes you know, on, a, on a routine basis? Uh, I, I suspect there are so many more things that can go wrong than can go right. That's yeah. almost an implication of the law of entropy, yeah. that it would not be surprising if we had adaptations to be vigilant for uh, danger, um, and also to be more impressed by events which we can always perceive compared to gradual improvements, which it takes a statistician to show. Mm. Your, your book, I believe, Better Angels, was written in 2011. <clears throat> which was in some ways the apogee uh, of that decline, if I can put it that way, in the, the short piece, those, those internal conflicts, um, as well as in terrorism. Since 2010, 2011, according to the UCDP and PRIO and other groups, there has actually been a, a kind of increase again after a long period of secular decline since 1945. Um, so there is, uh, more people are dying from conflicts in the last five to six years, at least since your book was written, than in the previous 20 to 30. Um, and there's also been an uptick in terrorism, albeit con hyper-concentrated in a smaller number of states uh, after a, a relatively long-term decline. Is there anything you would revise as part of your thesis now, looking at some of this, or is this just the natural noise that you see in, 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 in these longer-term trends? Well, in the, in the new book, in Enlightenment Now, I reproduce a number of the graphs from Better Angels extended six years, mm -hmm. and I have a little arrow pointing to the year in which the Better Angels of Our Nation went to press. In the case of uh, deaths in war, there was a, an um, increase uh, during the, the height of the Syrian civil war, which yeah. has since started to come back down. But even at its worst, uh, it is not true that it went back to prior levels. Mm. <clears throat> the, it, when um, Better Angels went to press, the worldwide per capita rate of death in uh, war was about one per 100,000 per year. With the Syrian civil war, that pushed it up to about 1.4. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've got to remember that during the 80s it was 5, during the 70s it was 9, mm -hmm. during the early 50s it was 22. Um, so even so the curve is a downward coursing uh, roller coaster um, and the Syrian civil war was a, kind of an uptick like that and went back down. So it was definitely in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. no, nothing to celebrate mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it seems to have peaked. Uh, but even then it wiped out maybe uh, uh, a dozen years of progress. And, and what about this, the more ominous sensation we have now around, say, Eastern Europe, particularly Russia and the United States, or North Korea, and the, th the, the drumbeat of war that seems to be announcing itself? Uh, is there... These, these are, these are diff different problems. Yes, I mean, exactly. I, you know, there, there was some uh, talk of, you know, would Russia invade the Baltics? Uh, seems yes. extremely, uh, extraordinarily unlikely yes. now. Um, <clears throat> and North Korea certainly very troubling news, and you really don't want leaders taunting each other and taking it away from the ra arena of rational calculation. But in the arena of rational calculation, it's extraordinarily unlikely for the obvious reason that, uh, that uh, the United States has and always will have the capacity for massive retaliation to a, a nuclear strike. Mm. North Korea's moves to develop nuclear capacity had an off obvious ra rational um, justification, namely, uh, Kim Jong-un now does not have to worry that what happened to Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi will happen to him. It mm -hmm. won't happen to him. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there will not be regime change. He knew that. He developed the nukes. Would he uh, launch an unprovoked attack on the United States? Well, obviously not, because, or almost certainly not, because 
uh, the United States would retaliate. This has nothing to do with Donald Trump's fire and fury speech. It's been the policy of the United States throughout the, the nuclear age. And there's no capacity, of course, for North Korea to wipe out the uh, second strike capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not that was even a, a possibility during the height of the Cold War, it was certainly discussed. And there were scenarios of the Soviets launching a preemptive strike that would eliminate their nuclear missiles in their silos. Uh, that, that, that possibility uh, doesn't exist at all today, which means that it's uh, extraordinarily unlikely that it will actually break out in war. Not that it's a good thing to rattle mm -hmm. sabers, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but got, things have to be kept in perspective, if for no other reason than to uh, inhibit possible rash responses, like, well, we had better launch a preemptive mm -hmm. strike so that they, uh, that they won't nuke us. I mean, you say in, in Better Angels, and I haven't read all of the, the new book, <clears throat> that we need to avoid technological determinism uh, and, and to maybe not overemphasize the weaponry itself. And I wonder, with the new types of weapons, on top of nukes, but the, the, the kinds of weaponry that are allowing for these rather extraordinary asymmetrical type conflicts to emerge, does that, does that challenge some of the equations, do you think, from your perspective of, uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the dilemmas that might prevent or, or incentivize leaders to go to conflict? Is there something... What kind of weapons do you have well, I'm talking about drones, I'm talking mm -hmm. about cyber weapons, digital weapons, weapons that where it's sometimes unclear who does the first strike or how you counter with a, with a, with a response. Is there something about the technology that maybe has changed in the last, say, decade and a half that maybe challenges a bit of that, that technological determinism? Or are you still... Well, no, I, I mean, I think technological <laughs> determinism is, continues to be wrong. That yes. is, uh, weapons don't, don't start wars all by themselves. And uh, research has shown that arms races don't precipitate wars. Uh, you can have countries that are armed to the teeth that just ne <coughs> never use their weapons. And the, the questions that you raise are very different in each case. Drones and cyber warfare are very different phenomena. Mm -hmm. I mean, by and large, what, what drones have done is reduced the human costs of war because there's just less uh, horrible euphemism as collateral damage. Right. But when there are more precision strikes, you don't have the kind of aerial bombardment that led to hundreds of thousands of millions of deaths in World War II in uh, the war in Vietnam. And so uh, ideally, the number of aerial strikes should be zero. But if they're taking place, they are, are um, much more humane with drones than with um, artillery or with aerial bombardment. I think people are, are increasingly nervous about automated drones, so sort of AI-enabled drones or the so-called killer robots, over which there's a, a, a fairly vibrant debate right now. And the fear of if, if the choices and of targets are essentially not determined by human agency, that this could result in a changing of the equation of, of conflict and warfare. Well, ultimately, they're decided by human agency in, in programming the robots. In the algorithm itself. So, yeah, exactly. Right. So it's not as if, uh, it's not, no one has any incentive to build a robot that would follow its own uh, agenda, despite a lot of these it's dystopian right. scenarios. But there's nothing, there's no motive that automatically comes with intelligence. And that's, a, I have a whole discussion of the uh, threat from artificial intelligence in Enlightenment now, Great. where I think um, most of it is uh, uh, completely bogus. Oh, it comes fabulous. From, yeah, it comes from, I think, a confusion of uh, intelligence with motivation. Uh, can we come back to that in a moment? Yeah. I, I want to I want to step back a little bit because the, the, the fill-in series is focusing specifically on the liberal order and it's the challenges it faces. And I, you offer a grand narrative <clears throat> or a series of narratives in a way to explain uh, the, the civilizing process and the decline of violence. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in that period since 1945. Um, and the dawn, as it were, of the so-called liberal order with its institutions. Let's talk about since Roosevelt, um, the Bretton Woods, the United Nations, the GATT, you know, the, 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 the GATT that became the WTO, uh, and then eventually other institutions. What, wh where does that fit? Where, where does the liberal order as an as a assemblage of principles, ideas, institutions fit within your narrative? Well, it's, res it's responsible for one of the, or actually two of the six declines of violence that I discuss in Better Angels. The f phenomenon of the long peace, mm -hmm. that is the um, uh, obsolescence of war between great powers and between developed states, and more generally between, between nations, because most wars have become civil wars. Mm -hmm. Civil wars tend to kill fewer people than interstate wars, something shown by Andrew Mack here mm -hmm. to Simon Fraser. Um, and there have been f fewer wars, fewer deaths in warfare, in, I think in, in large part because of the new international order, because of the existence of the United Nations and the, uh, the norm that war is not legitimate except in self-defense or with the approval of the uh, Security Council. Whether or not that has been enforced in 100% of the cases, the fact that it exists as a norm 
uh, has been significant, perhaps dating back even earlier to the Paris Peace Pact of 1928. And um, uh, Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro have argued that this was a, a pivotal uh, event that even though to much ridicule it did not prevent World War II, it was retroactively adopted and enforced with the founding of the United Nations in 1945. Mm. Uh, it's a, a real departure from human history that you can't say go to war to cl claim an, uh, an unpaid debt mm. or to prosecute any old grievance. That war is literally illegal, which for most of human history was not the case. War was the continuation of policy by other means. But anyway, that is part of the liberal order. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, and looking at graphs of a uh, number of wars, number of deaths in war, and amount of territory that's changed hands, one does see 1945 as a kind of turning point, and, and I think it's not a coincidence. 1945 and the post-war era also helped ino inaugurate a cascade of rights revolutions. Mm -hmm. First, the uh, civil rights revolution the uh, women's rights revolution, gay rights revolution, children's rights revolution, and uh, n now we're starting to see an animal rights revolution. And if we, if, if we can assume that the liberal order itself is, <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's down, but it's certainly been wounded um, most recently by the obvious elections in Western Europe and the United States uh, with leaders who themselves are backing away from supporting the liberal order, uh, but also from a longer term process of hollowing out of the middle class and, and some of the challenges that we're seeing. Do, do we, can we as, assume that these declines or can we hope that perhaps these declines that we've been seeing, especially since 45, would persist independent of the support of its chief architects, namely the United States uh, and some, some key states in Western Europe? In other words, can we see these, are, are the institutions embedded enough and are the values uh, uh, held dearly enough that we could imagine these these declines could be sustained. Yeah, so it's a, a difference whether we can imagine them being sustained and confident proclamations they will be sustained. Uh, yeah, we can certainly imagine them being sustained, and we, and we, we must not over-attribute the role of the United States in, in the, the liberal order. Mm -hmm. The United States has often been a rogue uh, mm -hmm. against the liberal order, such as in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, the United States, it, it's, I think it's a big mistake to equate the post-war liberal order with American policy. Uh, the United States has perpetrated some of the most destructive wars in the, in the post-war era, such as the Vietnam War. Um, and uh, so a pushback, a, a populist pushback in the United States is not the same as the unraveling of the, of the liberal order. The United States is, just, is, is, a, is a most powerful country, but it's just one country. Fair enough. But independent of the United States, are we, maybe just a little speculation, who, who do we see uh, in, in terms of nation states stepping up to fill some of that vacuum? That, recognizing the United States has played that sort of dual-faced role. Yeah. Well, most obviously uh, France yes. and Germany. Uh, and we might be saying, too, too soon to say, but you know, some of the most successful countries are um, small countries, small in terms of population and economies, like, like, uh, like Canada, like Portugal, mm. like Iceland, like uh, Ireland, like Switzerland, which by a lot of measures of uh, flourishing are doing much better than the great powers like the United States and, and even Britain and certainly Russia. Mm. Uh, and uh, smaller countries are more likely to innovate. They have less uh, politicized baggage for any change they may make in, in policy. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the cutting edge, the role models, may be these um, wealthy intermediate sides. Sort of countries. middle powers. Yeah. But what about the grill in the room, China? Yeah. How, where does China fit in, in, in the new book? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it dominates in so many ways, and it's very clear the rising of power. Uh, we are moving from a unipo unipolar to a multipolar or a multiplex world. How, how does China figure? Well, uh, 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 strikingly about China is how, um, <clears throat> d despite the expansion of the islands and beefing up the military, they haven't fought a whole lot of wars. I mean, I think the last yeah. one was in uh, a, a border skirmish in Vietnam in the late 80s, and then there was another one in 1979. But they have a much better track record of staying out of wars uh, than the United States, at least, certainly in the, at least in the post-Mao era. Um, and so, and as a, and a lot of people don't quite appreciate this, but there is a tension between commercial states and uh, martial states, mm -hmm. military states, that um, war is, is bad for trade, you know, bad, bad for business, and a regime that uh, vests its, its legitimacy on raising the standard of living for uh, as many of its people as it can, has a, and is enmeshed in commercial um, ties with the rest of the world, 
has a less of an incentive to screw those up by starting to fight wars. Mm. And so it may not be a coincidence that during the decades in which China abandoned the Maoist ideology and became this uh, you know, kind of hyper-capitalist society, even though they don't call it that, mm -hmm. uh, and it's retreated from uh, overt warfare, is, is probably not a coincidence. There are mm -hmm. data that show that countries that are more commercial and pairs of countries that have greater trading relationships are less likely to go to war. I'm sure you've heard about the uh, a number of cities in China right now that are uh, connecting with Alibaba, for example, on Foxconn to set up a digital spine for the city, which is setting up in a way a surveillance capability that's monitoring all aspects of citizens' movements. Um, and the idea is to track citizens' consumer habits, citizens' social media habits, citizens' uh, political habits, citizens' obedience of the law, um, all with the goal of creating a centralized system of data capture. Uh, and many people are concerned this might be a harbinger uh, of, of what's to come, this idea of the state capturing our data, um, using it in ways that may be a little nefarious. I think Harari goes as far as calling it digital dictatorships. And I'm wondering, what is your view right now on the accelerated pace of AI? You, you say that you've got a chapter devoted to it. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the potentials for abuse? Mm -hmm. uh, um, and why are you so sanguine about uh, the, the, the coming of uh, super intelligence or hyper automation? Yeah. Well, the, I, I think there's a, a genuine challenge of hyper-automation in terms of how the labor market will respond to many jobs being automated. Yes. There's a whole uh, a, a great deal of uncertainty there because we have not seen the massive loss of jobs that have been predicted from, from automation. Um, the uh, unemployment rate is close to a record low in the United States. Uh, and the, we know that labor markets can absorb huge shocks like entry of women into the workforce starting in the 1970s that did not lead to massive unemployment in men even though there were far more people working because uh, um, new opportunities are created for professions that didn't even exist before. Uh, ar artificial intelligence will certainly lead to the loss of certain jobs but we don't know how many new jobs that we can't even dream of will be created in response. Mm. Um, but it, that, that could be a challenge. The digital dictatorship, you know, we've had real dictatorships. China has had real dictatorships. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't take a whole lot of technology to, um, uh, to, to oppress a people because any dissident, almost by definition, has to uh, make his voice heard for him to be effective and that exposes him to repression. Mm -hmm. And there's a time-honored technique of uh, using old-fashioned social networks to uh, punish people who refuse to denounce uh, other people. Mm. And in Stalinist Russia, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Maoist China, in uh, medieval uh, repressive regimes, some of the most connected countries and, and uh, uh, technologically advanced countries are very open liberal democracies, like in, in Northern and Western Europe. Mm. Uh, so I think, I think that fears of repression, of dictatorship are, uh, are, are uh, real. Uh, I think one can imagine scenarios in which the most repressive government in combination with the most um, pervasive technology could do, uh, um, uh, exert a lot of oppression, kind of the 1984 scenario. Mm. But by and large, I think we've got to be much more vigilant against good old-fashioned violations of uh, uh, free speech and civil liberties and, and uh, political freedom, and that a focus on the technology is really misleading. I mean, we have to worry about uh, repressive forms of political correctness, of overexpansive laws that allow prosecutors to put in jail whoever they want, uh, pliant juries, plea bargaining. Uh, even though the technologists don't like to think politics and legal systems, mm. <clears throat> that's the locus of the, the greatest amount of um, uh, possibility for repression. Can you put your opponent in jail over bogus corruption charges? That makes a much bigger difference than does Facebook um, uh, soak up our, our uh, our, our likes and, and the pages that we visit. Mm. What about when it comes to the uh, neurochemistry or even the bio biological data um, or, or, or data biometric type information? So one thing is, is looking at your social media feeds or your likes and preferences or your consumption habits. Another is actually having access to the very chemistry of your, your body as, as we move towards wearables and other forms of technology. Um, and who owns that data and how that data is used, I think is a really important question. Um, you know, I, think, I think it's a concern, yeah. but in terms of fears of open liberal democracies versus closed uh, repressive autocracies, it, it's pretty low, low on the list. We have some very low tech, uh, um, murderously repressive governments in recent and past history. 
I, I think it's looking, I mean, I think it's a concern, but if you're uh, worried about government repression, then just follow the kinds of things that the, the Human Rights Foundation and Amnesty International track, where you've got massive differences and massive swings, such as even Maoist China versus today's China, yeah. and, you know, Nazi Germany versus uh, today's Germany, mm -hmm. um, North Korea versus South Korea. has very little to do with uh, data on your, your blood sugar. Let's, let's, let's shift to my final set of questions around identity politics and states. Um, there is a, st a strain of thought, a number of commentators have come out, concerned that there is a fracturing uh, of identity. Identity politics is contributing to a fracturing of, of, of both the left and the right. It's weakening, particularly to the left right now, because of all the emergence of uh, specific foci on very, uh, very narrow identity interests. Uh, you have come out as quite a vocal supporter of uh, advancing identity politics. I'm wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about... Supporter of... Uh, an opponent of... An opponent, opponent. I'm sorry, identity, identity politics. politics. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I want, excuse me. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of your reflections in the United States today. Yeah, I think, I think it is a concern, far greater concern than, uh, than, than big data, is a, a regime of intolerance of uh, heterodox opinions and the willingness to punish, shame, disenfranchise, silence people with uh, 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 opinions outside of the, the, uh, the mainstream. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that <clears throat> if you believe that there is, there are universal human interests, that is, everyone wants to live a long, healthy, educated, happy life. If you believe that there's an external reality that is the way it is regardless of uh, who's looking at it, uh, if you believe that there's truth, there's reason, there are certain arguments that are logical, others that are illogical, the color of the skin or the uh, number of, uh, of uh, X chromosomes of the person making the observation should be completely irrelevant. So the, the habit of preceding every statement with as a, and then you list your gender and your race and your handicap status and so on, uh, I think is pernicious in the uh, greater goal of trying to figure out what makes people better off and, and, and how the world works. How are we going to address that now? I mean, I think it has to be singled out as a problem mm -hmm. that uh, we have to uh, just remind people that even their own convictions, whether or not they actually uh, have admitted to them, they've got to believe that there's such a thing as truth. Otherwise, they couldn't defend what they're saying is true. Right. Uh, they've got to believe that there's an external reality. Otherwise, how can they uh, maintain that, uh, that, that slavery took place or discrimination or the Holocaust or global warming? There's just no way that you can get around a commitment to truth, objectivity, reality, logic. And that point has to be made very strongly. And you've made it, Steve. Thank uh, you as so much. Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you, and it's a dose of optimism. Uh, and I'm looking forward to um, obviously continuing the conversation. So best of luck with the book. Thank you, Rob. Cheers.